This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Neil A. Maxwell was given August 18, 1992. My sincere appreciation to President Lee and those who have planned this important set of days for you for the opportunity to be with you, brothers and sisters. To Michael for the beautiful music and to, just as importantly, the quality of his and his wife's personal discipleship. The title of my address is The Inexhaustible Gospel. It is intended to convey the vastness and preciousness of that enormous body of knowledge we call the gospel. And if I am at all successful, some of my ever-growing excitement over it will be conveyed to you as well. Before using terms like truth and knowledge, intelligence, education, and wisdom, I stress at the outset that the scriptural definitions of these terms give us as Latter-day Saints an added understanding of these concepts, <clears throat> and they differ from those of the world, markedly in fact. Each is added upon by the relevant revelations. These differences are especially worth noting during an education week. Please be patient now for several minutes <clears throat> while I attempt to note these distinctions. For example, our being saved by gaining knowledge obviously reform, uh, refers to a particular form of knowledge, a knowledge of God and the things of God. Nephi lamented, as you know, over those who, quote, will not search knowledge nor understand great knowledge. Clearly, he was referring to a particular kind of knowledge. In fact, <clears throat> Joseph Smith's translation of Jesus' lamentation about how those in his time had lost the key of knowledge is a definition which adds five words defining what the word key means, the fullness of the scriptures. So we see knowledge differently. Furthermore, Latter-day Saints know that certain knowledge comes only by revelation and is thereby only spiritually discerned. So we are on a different footing from the people of the world. Additionally, brothers and sisters, the scriptures make it clear that knowledge is to be associated with other virtues, such as patience, humility, charity, and kindness. Truth includes, but is not limited to, knowledge which corresponds to reality. Things as they were, things as they are, things as they will be. But gospel truth is morally richer therefore, than the world's definition of truth, as Terry Warner has observed. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. He has received a fullness of truth. Hence, we are to seek to have the mind of Christ. Furthermore, as to the manner of people we are to be, it is clear we are to strive to become even as Jesus is. If we keep the commandments, the promise is that we will receive truth and light until, quote, we are glorified in truth and knoweth all things. Therefore, gaining knowledge and becoming more Christ-like are two aspects of a single process. It is part of becoming valiant in our testimony of Jesus. And thus, while we're saved no faster than we gain a certain type of knowledge, it is also the case, as Richard Bushman has observed, that we will gain knowledge no faster than we are saved. So we have a fundamentally different understanding of knowledge and truth. Behaving and knowing are inseparably linked. So defined, <clears throat> the gospel is in inexhaustible because there is so much to know and so much to become. The vital truths are not merely accumulated in the mind, but are expressed in life as well. Intelligence is the glory of God, as we all know. It's defined as light and truth. The revelations also inform us that the more knowledge and the more intelligence we have in this life, we will have so much the advantage in the world to come. I do not pretend to be able to be definitive with regard to that last verse. But clearly, what we carry forward, brothers and sisters, 
involves our capacity for cognition as well as application. And this sets us apart from the world. I hope we understand the implications of these things. What we will carry forward is more than what we now term as IQ or a database. It is the entire being of the individual. Hence, our approach to knowledge and truth and wisdom is markedly different. What are some of the implications of the foregoing? First, some of us, and I include myself, sometimes casually speak of education for eternity. Brothers and sisters, it is so clear from the verses of Scripture that some truths may turn out to have a place in a yet-to-be-revealed hierarchy of truth that the world doesn't understand. The Scriptures tantalize us by saying truth is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it. One even wonders if truths like planets belong to a particular order, but we do not now know. The highest education, therefore, includes salvational truths, bringing us a knowledge of things as they really are and things as they really will be. This can be done without leaving the usual educational chores undone. And scholars like the president of Brigham Young University have President Rexley have surely demonstrated this. Ultimate orthodoxy, and orthodoxy isn't a popular word nowadays, but ultimate orthodoxy is expressed in the Christ-like life, which involves both mind and behavior. And Christ's manner of life is the way, the truth, and the light. And he has directed us to pursue his example. Another important <clears throat> implication of what we have been discussing is that all knowledge is not of equal significance. There is no democracy of facts. They are not of equal importance. Something might be factual but be unimportant, as Elder Spencer Condy has observed. For instance, today I wear a dark blue suit. That is true. It's unimportant. And the world doesn't quite understand this. And as we brush against this sense of truth that has a hierarchy of importance, we are dealing with things of transcending importance. Some truths are salvationally significant, and others are not. Another important insight <clears throat> is that knowledge is intended to travel in a convoy of other Christian virtues. It does not have final meaning by itself. Otherwise, a possessor of some knowledge, as Peter said, who lacketh these other things, cannot see afar off. Interesting concept. Precious perspective is missing unless knowledge is accompanied by these other truths. There are some other insights that bear down upon us as Latter-day Saints. Brilliance by itself is not wholeness nor happiness. Knowledge, if possessed for its own sake and unapplied, leaves one's life unadorned. A church member, for instance, might describe the Lord's doctrines, but not qualify to enter the Lord's house. One could produce much brilliant commentary without being exemplary. One might be intellectually brilliant, but bohemian in behavior. One might use his knowledge to seek preeminence or dominion. Such are not Jesus' ways. For he asked that perception and implementation be part of the same spiritual process. We, in Alma's words, are to give place in our lives for the good seed of the gospel to grow. And it involves a form of knowing which includes cognition as well as implementation. As we all know, Christ does not dominate us by his intellect, though he might. He leads by example and by love. There is no arrogance flowing from his, the keenest of all intellects. He does not seek to conquer or to prosper according to his genius. Now, given these foregoing views of restoration theology <clears throat> as they pertain to knowledge and truth and wisdom and education, there is finally no comfort zone for vanity or hypocrisy. There is no sanctuary for them. 
Clearly, <clears throat> in such a situation as I've attempted to describe altogether too briefly, a few individuals in the church <clears throat> end up looking beyond the mark, missing the already obvious. These few individuals in the church let their minds seek to run far ahead of their confirming behavior. For them, exciting exploration is preferred to plodding implementation. Speculation and argumentation are more fun than consecration for these individuals. Some even try to soften the hard doctrines. What happens, however, is by not obeying, they lack knowing, as we are discussing it today. And thus they cannot defend the faith, and a few of them become critics instead of defenders. As far as salvational truths are concerned, therefore, <clears throat> the secular knowledge explosion in recent years, with all of its many and unarguable, unarguable benefits to mankind, has not been a bang at all. It's been merely a whimper. It was the restoration which provided the explosion of salvational knowledge. I now ha hasten to add, <clears throat> having said these preliminary things, that the role of secular knowledge is very important. Latter-day Saints should have all the genuine excitement others have in the traditional adventure of learning, including learning secular truths. And we should have a little more. In fact, when we are so learning and so behaving, we are truly about our Father's business. And this should bring for us a special and genuine zest for learning. Furthermore, those of us who have spent much of our lives involved with traditional education regard it as one of mankind's most useful and productive and cost-beneficial enterprises. It is even more beneficial, however, <clears throat> when it has the spiritual dimension added to it, which we are discussing today. Secular education wisely does not pretend to give us answers to the great why questions any more than you and I, brothers and sisters, would read a telephone directory in search of a plot. <laughs> Furthermore, our different frame of reference should never cause us to preen or to be insensitive to the uncertainty or despair some feel in the world precisely because they believe, sincerely, that man exists in godless geometric space. By the way, I have always had a special appreciation for my friends who, though resolutely irreligious, were not scoffers. Instead, though doubtless puzzled by me and their other religious friends, they were nevertheless respectful. I admire the day-to-day -day decency of such men and women. Though detached from theology, their decency is so commendable. I give you now a lamentation from one character in one play <clears throat> which illustrates, however, the despair and pain felt by many. <clears throat> he says, are all men's lives broken, tumultuous, agonized, and unromantic? Who knows? I don't know. Why can't people have what they want? The things were all there to content everybody, yet everybody got the wrong thing. It's beyond me. It's all darkness. As if speaking to this very point, the prophet Joseph Smith observed, knowledge does away with darkness and suspense and doubt, for these cannot exist where knowledge is. There is no pain, he said, so awful as that of suspense. Joseph, of course, was speaking about a particular kind of knowledge. Thus, <clears throat> our view of education is the same as Jesus prescribed with regard to our other Christian duties. Namely, the weightier matters should receive their deserved prominence without leaving the lesser learning chores undone. The prophet Joseph Smith also observed, if you wish to go where God is, you must be like God or possess the principles which God possesses. God possesses perfect knowledge but he also possesses perfect love and mercy. What a contrast he is for those mortals you and I encounter who are bright but bad, who are clever 
but carnal. Even genius without goodness can be dangerous. No wonder, therefore, to be learned is good if we hearken to the counsels of God instead of setting them aside as if we have somehow outgrown them. How can one ever outgrow Christ's example? The example of knowing and behaving and doing. <clears throat> what happens, however, is that some easily fall into the trap described by Paul when they are ever learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. One might learn a great deal about the physical characteristics of this planet Earth, but yet be ignorant of why it was created in the first place. Certainly during Education Week, <clears throat> we need to know the plan for the week, what the presentations are, and what room, at what time. Such information for the moment is essential. But compare having that information to knowing the truth about God's plan of salvation. For mortals, therefore, the gospel is inexhaustible, because the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Jacob's words are strikingly similar to Paul's. For the Spirit speaketh the truth of things as they really are, and of things as they really will be. Unsurprisingly, the scriptural definition of truth matches. It is a knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they are to come. What vastness! While encountering and exploring such vastness, we sometimes know more than our tongues can tell. Indeed, knowledge which is spiritually discerned is not always easily communicated. But the ultimate place we hope to be is one in which, in the presence of God, all things are manifest, past, present, and future, and they are continually before the Lord. What a wondrous God we worship. The prophet Joseph Smith said, the past, present, and future were and are with Jehovah one eternal now. Even so, how different the Lord's now is from ours. In exploring this comprehensiveness and everlastingness, there will be some surprises. Our understanding of some things will be restructured and expanded, especially in the world to come. For I hath not seen nor hear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. In eternity, when the faithful receive all that the Father hath, this will include an enormous enlargement intellectually. However, some divine disclosure can begin even now in mortality. For by my spirit I will enlighten them, and by the power of my self I will make known unto them the secrets of my will, yea, even those things which I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor yet entered into the heart of man. Furthermore, brothers and sisters, having been given so many marvelous truths, we're to share them in order that, quote, wise men and rulers may hear and know that which they have never considered. So much of the gospel we bring is what people have never considered. Quite understandably, understandably given its very nature, God's latter-day work will be regarded with much skepticism by many. The Lord foresaw this, saying he would bring to pass my strange act and perform my strange work that men may discern. By accessing the inexhaustible divine data bank through meekness and righteousness, thereby using the Spirit, scriptures, and prophets, special wisdom is open to us as the Spirit teaches us of things as they really are and really will be. President Brigham Young, who had his share of spiritual experiences, said, The honest in heart savor the gospel with the inward taste and see with the inward eyes. In God's strange work, his ways of informing mankind are likewise unusual. Therefore, he sent angels to converse with them, who caused men to behold of his glory, and they began from that time forth to call upon his name. Therefore, God conversed with men and made known unto them his plan of redemption, which had been prepared from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> Ironically, many refuse to examine gospel truths simply because of how God reveals them. These very methods swell skepticism among many. Furthermore, these divine disclosures are not democratically dispensed. 
because such things are, quote, made known unto them according to their faith and repentance and their holy works. However, when people are left alone, without angelic visitations, without divine disclosures, without prophets, without the Spirit, many cease believing. Belief in certain basics is the first thing to go, as happened in the Book of Mormon. They cease believing in God, in the resurrection, and in Christ. Many in the world hold back from making the leap of faith because they've already jumped to some other conclusions, the Korhor conclusions, which are God never was nor ever will be. There is no redeeming Christ. Man cannot know the future and cannot know that which he cannot see. And whatsoever a man does is no crime and death is the end. The Korhor conclusions will grow in intensity on this planet in terms of their acceptation. So positioned, many mortals do not accept the fullness of the gospel. Their reactions to the gospel range from indifference to contempt. Happily, there are some who are meek enough to consider that which they have never considered and never had supposed. When Moses learned, was learned in being schooled as a result of his life with the Egyptians, what he learned there did not compare in eternal significance to what he learned from God's revelations. He learned things he said he never had supposed. The great who, what, and why questions are those on which the transcending revelations focus. What, for instance, is God doing? For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Who is involved? That by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. God's revelations do not usually give us answers to the how and when questions, such as concerning the creation of the earth. Yes, there are revelations such as the building of an ark, a revelation not reusable, by the way, and on other tactical matters. But the recurring themes of the revelations are spiritual. Thus, the creator of the universe does not choose to dazzle his audiences with data concerning the creation. Rather, he is a perfect shepherd and is interested in the central needs and concerns of his sheep in his many folds. These revealed truths carry behavioral as well as intellectual responsibilities. When informed, we are accountable. Solomon, for instance, was widely known for his wisdom, much celebrated. Impressively wise, however, as Solomon doubtless was in many respects, he was not wise enough to keep God's seventh commandment fully. Individuals are often otherwise commendable, <clears throat> as was Morianton, who did do justice unto his people, but not unto himself, because of his many whoredoms. In gospel wisdom, knowing and behaving are irrevocably linked. One basic limitation of worldly wisdom is its lack of longitudinality. <clears throat> and of precious perspective. Worldly wisdom cannot see afar off. And without a spiritual memory, and without a spiritual will, past mistakes are repeated and folly is resumed. Winston Churchill chose, by the way, as the motto for his last volume of World War II history, these words, how the great democracies triumphed and thus were able to resume the follies which had so nearly cost them their lives. The world in its search for physical security, for instance, tends to build Maginot lines while naively neglecting its northern flank. It seeks to control diseases flowing from sexual immorality but without honoring the principles of fidelity and chastity. The world in its wisdom constantly seeks to accommodate the natural man while gospel wisdom constantly urges us to put off the natural man. This is a pivotal point and it makes all the difference. Being so immersed in the gospel framework, we sometimes fail to realize how illuminating gospel truths are with regard to so many issues of the day. For instance, given the plan of salvation with our need to experience this mortal school and acquire a mortal body and the preciousness of human life, we see the awful practice of widespread abortion differently. Similarly, Struggling to have the mind of Christ, which includes purity of thought and letting virtue garnish our thoughts unceasingly, we view pornography as an awful and enslaving thing. We cannot feel otherwise 
concerning such practices as abortion and pornography, even if they are legally and constitutionally protected. This is not to say we expect others to share our views or even to understand them. Some will not even tolerate our views, but will attempt to shame us. But if we are really the saints of the Holy One, we will endure the crosses and despise the shame of the world. Whether worldly shame or worldly temptations, like Jesus, we should give no heed unto them. These salvational truths we're speaking of today combine longevity and relevancy. They have span and significance. Education that's concerned only for a season is narrow. It pertains only to a knowledge of things as they temporarily are like today's weather forecast or an airline schedule. Temporary facts are useful but terminal. Jesus noted the intensity of the children of this world, but their operative framework, he said, was in this generation. Given such significant gradations among knowledge, we resonate to T.S. Eliot's words, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Thus, our consuming of certain information is like consuming our daily bread. We need it, but it's perishable. We will soon hunger again. Instead, the bread of life is inexhaustible. Ultimate wisdom enables us to see Jesus as the light of the world. But further, we come to realize that it is by his light that we are to see everything else. And the gospel bright and illuminating as it is, helps us to see God, ourselves, others, the world and universe much more deeply. Paul declared correctly, in Christ all things hold together. For now, though we can mercifully see something of our eventual possibilities, you and I become aware of our present limitations. Tolkien wrote wisely, it is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what is in us for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know so that those who live after may have a clean earth to till. What weather they shall have is not ours to rule. Hence, we desperately need the gospel's wisdom, wisdom for the succor of those years wherein we are set in order to do what is in us. Enoch got that reassurance and exclaimed over God, yet thou art there. And that's what you and I want to know of him. Does he know me, love me, care for me? And we can have that same reassurance. How intellectually amazing, therefore, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ is. It is truly inexhaustible. It is marvelous. It is a wonder. Yet orthodoxy is required. <clears throat> to keep all these truths in essential balance. In orthodoxy lies real safety and real felicity. Flowing from orthodoxy is not only correctness, but happiness. And orthodoxy is especially vital in a time of raging relativism and belching sensualism. The world's morality is constantly being improvised. Some views are politically correct one day, but not another. One writer recently observed of the relativistic forces at work, these should warm every atheist's heart. For if God is a socially conscious political being whose views invariably correspond to our own prejudices on every essential point of doctrine, he demands of us no more than our politics require. How would our worship of this kind of being constitute more than self-congratulation for our own moral standards? The writer continues, as an atheist, I like this God. It's good to see him every morning while I am shaving. Yes, being learned is good. It can supply us with the needed facts and develop a, a facility with facts and a discernment among facts. It can help us to use our minds to cultivate an intellectual adroitness in connecting the patches of truth and insight. It certainly furthers the calisthenics of the intellect. Finally, however, you and I should be fully qualified and certified in traditional education and its processes for yet another good reason, bilinguality. The men and women of Christ should be truly educated and articulate as to secular knowledge, 
but should also be educated and articulate in the things of the Spirit. I close now by speaking further of Jesus, our perfect shepherd. His atoning experience placed upon him the pain, sicknesses, sorrow, and grief and pains of the whole human experience <clears throat> in order that he might know, according to the flesh, how to succor his people according to their infirmities. <clears throat> he suffered the pain of all men, women, and children and was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Thus, Jesus, in the agony of the atonement, descended below all of these things in order that he might comprehend all things. How marvelous the mind of Christ which we are to try to come to have. Jesus, our perfect exemplar, was astonishingly exemplary even in the hours surrounding the awful but the glorious atonement. <clears throat> the intrigue of Pilate and Herod, for instance, who had earlier been at enmity but who made friends together because of Jesus, presented opportunities for Jesus to shrink from going through with the atonement. Herod, who'd been desirous to see Jesus of a long season, hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Yet Jesus, under heavy questioning from Herod, answered him nothing. Jesus' integrity and intellect were not for sale. Amid temptation, he maintained his integrity even in the midst of an opportunity which a lesser individual would have seized to reduce his suffering and to increase the praise of men. Ironically, when Jesus' enemies came for him, the light of the world, they came with lanterns and torches. There, Jesus, who might have understandably by then <clears throat> had been so swollen with self-concern that there was no time to think of others, nevertheless restored the severed ear of a hostile guard. Amid irony, he kept his poise. He kept his way, which is not the way of the sword. Christ spoke only several sentences on the cross. One of them was to ensure that his mother Mary would be cared for by John. Another sentence reassured a thief on an adjoining cross. He had empathy amid his agony. Finally, he maintained his consecration in the midst of the deepest deprivation anyone can know. President Brigham Young has taught us that in the course of the astonishing atonement, the Father withdrew his presence from Jesus and his spirit from Jesus and cast a veil over him. Thus, Jesus became utterly totally alone. And there then came that great cry of forsakenness. Nevertheless, Jesus did not shrink, but instead finished his preparations unto the children of men. As he promised pre-mortally, when he might have reflected a little credit upon himself, he nevertheless gave all the glory to the Father. We need not apologize for regarding Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. We need not apologize for regarding salvational knowledge revealed by him as being the most precious. Indeed, in Christ, all things hold together, for he is perfect in knowing, perfect in doing, and most marvelously, he has challenged us to become like him. Of him I testify, of his standard of truth and knowledge and behavior I testify. He is the light of the world. May we reflect his light in our lives, distinguishing between the things of the moment, the facts that dissolve, and the supernal transcending knowledge of spiritual things, which is the great blessing he has given us through the restored gospel. It is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Neil A. Maxwell was given August 18, 1992.